So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Linford. I work for ARM, and I'm joined here by Stephen Sachs, who works for AWS. And today we're going to talk about how you can characterize HPC workload performance on the AWS Graviton2 platform. So the outline of our talk today, um, I'll take five minutes to introduce the idea of high performance computing, HPC, um, and sort of level set on what it is we mean when we're talking about HPC or supercomputing. Um, Stefan will give us an overview of AWS Graviton2 and how it can be used for high performance computing workloads. And then we'll switch back um, and I will talk about how we can characterize HPC application performance in general. And specifically, some of the works that we, some of the work we've done on the Graviton2 for HPC. And we'll show some performance results from a handful of key workloads um, running on the Graviton2. So first I want to discuss um, HPC and, and try to level set here because uh, high performance computing, supercomputing, it has a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. Um, when I talk about HPC, I'm talking about a highly coupled, um, highly flexible computing platform for addressing extremely challenging problems. So these are leadership class computing systems um, as, as large as data centers or larger than data centers um, with hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of cores and uh, record setting network characteristics so that all of these cores can be uh, brought together and, uh, and orchestrate together uh, to focus all that computing power on one problem at a time. Um, these are enormous systems consuming many megawatts of power. So the more efficient they can, uh, you, the software uh, can, can run on the system, the more efficiently the scientists can use them, um, the more science you can get done on the same budget, uh, the faster you can get your results. So performance engineering and tuning applications for the platform uh, is a key part of HPC because you really need to operate as close to maximum efficiency as possible. Um, now, a key difference between um, a supercomputing and, uh, and a uh, data center is that HPC, center, HPC systems tend to operate as one system. So data centers will usually try to address throughput and, and serve many different users simultaneously. Um, supercomputers, especially on-prem supercomputers, tend to be dedicated to a small number of jobs at once. Now, the interesting thing is that this distinction between supercomputer and data center has really started to blur and is becoming less relevant over time. Um, we are seeing data centers with um, networking capabilities and orchestration capabilities that are, are matching or maybe even exceeding what are available on on-prem supercomputers. And so HPC in the cloud is becoming a very viable and a very attractive option over uh, on-prem HPC. Now, some things that you typically see in a, in a HPC environment, uh, your operating system is pretty much always Linux. Um, the, the one exception here might be financial markets where they do use Windows in HPC environments, but most people will be using uh, Linux. Once upon a time, there was a Mac OS HPC system, but generally speaking, it's going to be RHEL or SLES or Debian. On AWS, you have Amazon Linux, um, which can also be used for HPC workloads. Um, you also find support for legacy software, things like uh, code written in Fortran that may be 20 or even 30 years old. Uh, which for various reasons can't be rewritten, these codes need to be able to operate in that system. So you find Fortran compilers um, and support for very old programming methodologies and paradigms. Um, you also typically have access to the system through a queue. Now, remember that the idea behind a supercomputer is to take all the processing power and focus it on one problem at a time. And that means that usually only one or two, maybe a few users will be on the system at a time. And so if you want to use the system, you have to get into a queue and, and wait your turn. This is where cloud computing really stands out because if you have an on-prem supercomputer and someone has already taken over the system to run their jobs, you can wait sometimes many days or even weeks to get your workload even started on that system. HPC in the cloud, because there's such an enormous amount of computing resource there, allows you to carve off a piece of the cloud and use it like a supercomputer um, and immediately start your jobs rather than waiting. So this is another attractive um, option for, for the cloud is that you still use the queue system, but you're allowed to set up your own queue in a sense and get quick get to work faster. Um, 
We're also seeing Python is rapidly becoming a mainstream computing language for HPC. G generally, Python is used to tie together different uh, low-level tuned kernels, math libraries, and things, but it provides a high-level language to express the problem. Um, containers are also rapidly becoming a thing in, in HPC. For a while, they were, they were disregarded, but recently, um, research uh, had, have um, made large strides in, in improving container efficiency and security, and this has made them very attractive to HPC users. Some things you generally won't see in HPC today include Java, Ruby, Rust, um, any kind of language that emphasizes productivity over performance, because it's a high performance computer. We really are emphasizing the performance aspect of the system. This is the sort of software landscape that we're looking at when, when we move to HPC. Now, how about ARM? Well, ARM is not uh, is, is a relative newcomer to the HPC space. Uh, starting at about 2018, ARM announced the Neoverse line of server class CPUs. And off the back of that announcement, we've had a number of key wins in the HPC space. So um, NVIDIA have announced that their CUDA software stack is fully supported on ARM as a, you know, call it a first class citizen. So alongside x86 and power. So if you have an NVIDIA GPU, you can plug it into an ARM host and just get started with CUDA. And that enables a number of, of HPC machine learning, data processing workloads that can use GPUs to accelerate the, the results. Um, now, in, uh, in uh, shortly after that, our AWS announced the Graviton 2 server CPU. Now, this is off the back of the very successful Graviton 1. Graviton 2 brings further performance improvements, which Stephen will detail in a moment. Now, over the most recent thing to happen for ARM and HPC is that currently the fastest supercomputer in the world, according to the HPL benchmark, is the Fujitsu Fugaku system at Riken in Japan. Fugaku implements the ARM architecture. So the fastest supercomputer in the world is using the ARM instruction set architecture on a custom Fujitsu microarchitecture. And I think that really demonstrates the power of, of ARM as a platform for HPC, the ability to quickly bring uh, software solutions to the space. So it's very exciting times for us. So now I'd like to turn it over to Stephen so he can uh, talk about the Graviton 2 and discuss uh, how you can use the Graviton 2 for HPC. Thanks, John. Um, so I'd like to show you what um, our ARM-based instances look like and what you need to build your own ARM-based uh, uh, HPC cluster in the cloud. So at reInvent 2018, and for those who don't know, that is our annual AWS developer conference, we launched our first ever uh, ARM instance powered by the Graviton processors. Um, these featured the ARM Neoverse cores and contained up to 16 cores and 32 gigabytes of RAM per instance. Um, these were our first ever ARM server processors and are built on top of the AWS Nitro system. So this system offloads many of the traditional virtualization functions to dedicated hardware. Um, this hardware offload uh, delivers practically all of the compute and memory resources uh, of the host hardware to your instances for better performance and scalability. Now these instances, uh, deliver significant cost savings over other general purpose instances for scale out workloads, such as web servers or containerized microservices or data or log processing. Um, basically anything that can uh, work with a small memory footprint and not so beefy cores. So not exactly HPC. Now, one year later at uh, reInvent 2019, we announced our second generation uh, instances powered by ARM processors. Uh, the Graviton 2 delivers a major leap in performance and uh, capabilities over that first generation. Uh, they provide up to 40% better price performance over comparable x86-based instances for a wide variety of workloads. And John will show you what this means for HPC. Um, these, um, the Graviton 2 processors are available in three different instance types with two, four, and eight gigabytes of RAM per core, respectively. Now, these instances contain up to 64 cores, 
are enhanced networks, enhanced networking enabled and have higher storage throughput than their predecessors. Now, how do you use those for HPC? Well, the Graviton 2 based instances are available in our HPC tools like Parallel Cluster or AWS Batch. And these tools are used to create a familiar environment for HPC users and um, while levering the uh, cloud resources for the compute and the storage needs. Um, the compute resources only get provisioned when the jobs are placed into the queue. And as soon as the queue is empty, those uh, resources are actually quickly scaled down again. So the cluster is basically uh, empty when it's idle. Another major differentiator um, of the uh, cloud HPC is that you can uh, tune and adapt your um, compute environment to your application. And you can do that on a per application basis. So once you've selected the right uh, instance type for your application, you can also select the right storage. Like uh, if you say you want parallel uh, luster file system, or if you want local disk or an object storage, you can tune and, um, and make that the right size uh, for your application needs. Now let's take parallel cluster as an example. Uh, once you've selected uh, the, uh, the hardware that you're running on, you, are, uh, you can mix and match that with uh, a choice of operating systems. In this case, uh, Amazon Linux or Ubuntu. Uh, you can mix and match that with different HPC schedulers, such as Slurm or Torque or AWS Batch and different pre-installed software components. So for example, DCV for remote visualization. And once you hit play on that cluster, you will be presented with a familiar integrated cluster environment with a shared file system, with modules environment pre-installed, with uh, the scheduler up and running, and all the HPC configurations uh, where you can go ahead, install and run your applications using even the same uh, scheduler scripts and the same workflows that you produced in your on-prem environment. Um, you can also use any of the performance tools that John's gonna mention later. Now, how do you um, actually take care of all of this? How do you, uh, as I said, the cluster will uh, scale by itself up and down. Um, but you still have full control of uh, your uh, of your um, um, of, of the resources that you have provisioned. So uh, you can either do that through a command line interface, or you can do that uh, via a web console. Um, there's also the uh, you, you can also do. Uh, performance monitoring. So for example, if you want to know what's going on on your cluster right now, this uh, example I'm showing here right now is, uh, is CloudWatch. It's uh, something that we, uh, by default, uh, will show you things like uh, CPU utilization, uh, disk IO, uh, network IO, and you can tune that. You can, you can feed any kind of metric or log that you want into that. So if you want to see things like TLB misses or cache usage, you can just do that. And as I said, this is just an example for uh, CloudWatch. You can easily integrate any of your own solutions using Grafana or Prometheus or whatever tool you like. And additionally, there's also a cost explorer dashboard that will show you your current spending and the details on what you're spending on. Okay, so I would like to invite you to try this out on your own. Go to hpcworkshops.com and start building your own ARM HPC cluster in the cloud. So that's a step-by-step -step self paced workshop that will guide you through building your first HPC cluster. You can select any of the Graviton 2 based instances that I mentioned before, add parallel file systems, remote visualization and more. You can 
upload your applications on that, get running with uh, scheduler scripts right away, or actually uh, tune your applications for best performance uh, on, on the Graviton processor. And that's where I'm handing back to John. He will tell you how to tune your applications. Thanks, Stefan. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about how you can characterize HPC application performance on, on any platform. And then I'll call out the parts of this which are more specific to AWS Graviton and, and ARM. Now, whenever you start to do a performance engineering effort on a code, uh, you want to begin by profiling your code. Now, there's a number of uh, very good profiles out there, and I'll introduce a few, all of which work on the Graviton. Um, but it doesn't really matter what tool you use as much as the tool needs to provide detailed information about the different um, components of the application performance. So these might be the time that the application spends in file I.O., or the time it spends in communication or memory, um, or the time it spends in the compute. Now. Do an initial profile of your code, usually a high-level profile. It doesn't have to be very detailed, and you want it to have minimum overhead. And then look at what are the hot spots in that profile. Is the application spending a lot of time in file I.O., for instance? Once you've identified one major hotspot, focus on the single uh, aspect of performance that is most relevant to that hot, hot spot. For instance, don't try to address uh, file I.O. and communication problems at the same time. Try to address one problem at a time so that you can quantify the impact of any changes you make in the code. So if you select, for example, file I.O., then you might explore uh, options like parallel file systems or in-memory file systems. Or with AWS, you might, you might want to provision um, on-instance uh, storage so that you have local storage that you can write to rapidly. Using these different tricks, you might be able to get better performance even without modifying the source code. Once you make changes to your environment or to the application, rerun the profile to quantify the impact of those changes. You'll be amazed at how many times you'll think that you understand the performance of your application and you fully understand, uh, you, you, you're able to predict what the impact of the change would be, but then on the second profile, you'll see that the impact was either much greater or less than what you expected, or perhaps didn't make any change at all. And so it's crucial that you continue profiling, and, and profiling is really central to the whole effort. The numbers I've shown next to the hotspots, the 50x, 10x, 5x, 2x, these are the slowdowns that I've seen in the real world applications when that aspect of performance has been done badly. So I'm not necessarily saying you'll get a 50x performance improvement by optimizing your file I.O., but I'm saying that if I wanted to slow a code down by 50x, I would start by doing file I.O. badly. So this is a good workflow to, to start with. If your code is exceptionally slow, start by looking at file I.O. Then move on to the communication pattern. Perhaps if you're using MPI, look at the network characteristics of the instances that you provision. Uh, then move into your memory access patterns. And finally, start working on compute, vectorization, um, parallel processing, things like that. Now, I mentioned there's a lot of profiles out there. Uh, a great place to find a good profiler is the VIHPS Tools Guide. This is a guide to various open source profiling, debugging, and optimization tools, which is provided by a consortium of companies and uh, universities and research groups, mostly based out of Europe, um, primarily in, in Germany, to be honest. Um, but if you look down this guide, there'll be annotations in the margins that will indicate the architectures, languages, and uh, communication libraries that the tool supports. So you can rapidly find a number of tools that uh, support ARM, support AWS, or even um, in some cases are optimized for the communication libraries that you'll find in, uh, in AWS Parallel Cluster. In addition to these open source community free tools. Uh, most of those tools are supported by um, research efforts or by uh, support contracts. ARM also provides a commercial environment for software engineering called the ARM Alenia Studio. Alenia Studio includes uh, native compilers, libraries, and tools for developing ARM HPC applications or high performance applications of any kind, as well as cross-platform profilers and debuggers. So taken together, this is a complete environment for HPC development. It works well on the Graviton 2. Um, I use it there. My team uses it there. 
uh, and it is a, a good place to start performance engineering. The debugger included with Alenia Studio is called DDT. The DDT debugger is one of maybe two or three debuggers in the world that can scale out to enormous numbers of processes and not incur enormous overhead. So it's a highly scalable toolkit with a nice graphical user interface that allows you to do some very powerful things. Like you can analyze the memory usage of each process in your application, even if you're running hundreds or tens of hundreds of thousands uh, of, app of processes. Uh, it also allows you to look at pending communications between processes. So on a MPI application, you could do tag matching to see which process is communicating which with, with another process. This is very useful for uncovering the, the cause of things like deadlock in a highly parallel application. It also lets you visualize data structures in memory as they're being computed. Uh, this is a, a fun way to check, you know, maybe your code is running, but it's actually giving you the wrong answer at the end. Um, I was working with some plasma physicists at the POSI Supercomputing Center who used this feature to watch the solution evolve, a sort of in situ visualization of their application so that they could confirm that the answer coming out of the, after the, of the simulation they were working on was correct. Uh, so this is a very powerful tool, very scalable tool. It's a good way to get started in making sure that your code is giving you the right answers before you start tuning performance. Now, I mentioned that when you begin your profiling and your performance engineering, um, you should start with a high level profile with minimal overhead. And the map profiler included with R Millennia Studio is a good place to start. Many profilers can do this. Tau, Scholasca, SCORE-P, HPC Toolkit, um, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, Forge is, is um, a very high level profiler that will just show you time spent in hotspots and in certain aspects of your application. For example, you can see how much time is spent in MPI overhead or OpenMP overhead. You can see how much time is spent moving data to a GPU or, or, or back. Um, and it also supports multiple languages like Python, C, C++, Fortran, so on. Uh, but in, in my experience, what I usually do with MAP is I get my initial high profile, high level profile, and then I switch to a more detailed, more powerful tool, something like Tau or Scholasco would be a good choice. Liquid uh, is another very good one. Uh, Liquid has additional support for ARM architectures and works quite well on the, uh, the Graviton 2. I uh, recommend Liquid as, uh, as a great step after MAP. So I want to show a little bit of work that we've been doing uh, in partnership with AWS on the Graviton2 that's been focused on optimizing HPC workloads. Now, HPC is a big space with a lot of uh, connections to a lot of different industries. And so to maximize the impact of the work we're doing, we've been focusing on key verticals, uh, aerospace and automotive, oil and gas, and government public sector computing. This tends to be weather prediction, um, ocean modeling, that sort of thing. And we've selected specific codes from these areas that we want to optimize, profile, and demonstrate on the Graviton2. So I'll show you a few results from these applications. First, uh, a computational fluid dynamics code. This work was done in part uh, with AWS. It appeared in the keynote presentation of the Open Foam Conference uh, held virtually in Annapolis back in June. And you can read all about it on Amazon's blog here at aws.amazon.com, you see the URL. And we ran the OpenFoam simulation on x86 platforms and also the Graviton2 platform. What we found is that the runtime of the Graviton2 is approximately the same uh, as the x86, and in some cases it's better than the x86, but the price of the Graviton2 instance is so much more competitive than the x86 that the cost of your simulation is greatly reduced. Now this is very exciting news for commercial commodity um, uh, HPC users such as uh, Formula One, aerospace, uh, 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 people who design pumps, uh, you know any kind of um, any, any kind of application that needs to do uh, computational fluid dynamics or modeling um, and needs to do it on a budget. So we've seen a lot of interest in this work as it's a really powerful proof point demonstrating the cost per uh, simulation can be quite low with the Graviton2. Another example, uh, this is from the government and public sector computing. 
the weather prediction uh, model, which is uh, the U European Unified model, model, we took the ocean part of that NEMO and ran it on a variety of x86 and ARM platforms. We found that for this particular uh, simulation, ARM was faster in all cases. It was also cheaper in all cases. Now this is very interesting because the weather community have been in the forefront of using cloud computing uh, for HPC. And so they're very interested in being able to rapidly scale out hurricane simulations or uh, any kind of situation that needs a, a, an answer quickly. Uh, so being able to demonstrate that you can do this at, at faster and cheaper on the Graviton 2 uh, is very compelling for them. And finally, uh, oil and gas. Um, we look a look, took a look at uh, seismic, mo seismic modeling with SpecFem 3D on AWS Graviton 2. And we see that not only is the code running uh, competitively with x86 and uh, more affordably, uh, it is also scaling very well. So you'll, you'll recall that I said one of the distinctions between a supercomputer and a data center is the supercomputer tends to have uh, a network that allows you to treat the system as one. We're seeing that that's no longer a fair distinction when comparing supercomputers and data centers. In fact, the data centers, they're just as powerful when it comes to scale out computing that involves taking the same application and running it on a large number of cores. So we're very excited by this result. And I think it's very compelling that we can do seismic modeling in the cloud um, cheaper and faster than what some of the uh, oil and gas users have on-prem. Now, again, I wanna encourage you to visit hpcworkshops.com, just as Stefan said. This is an excellent resource for getting started with Parallel Cluster rapidly, and it will let you play around with the tool and start your uh, performance engineering workload on your own codes um, right out of the box. So do please have a look there. And with that, I wanna thank you for attending our talk.